All right, it's uh, 2.30 now, so we're gonna get started here. Thanks, thank you for all coming. I hope you've had a good conference so far. Uh, so, uh, I'm, my name is Sean Walbridge. Uh, I'm a software developer at Esri. I work on the geoprocessing team, uh, specifically on the Python team. Uh, I work on Python and also on our uh, R uh, work. We're gonna be, the next session is gonna be on the R work, but today we're gonna talk about scientific programming with the SciPy stack, and this is Kevin. I'm Kevin Butler. I'm one of the two Kevin Butlers at Esri. So, if you see great raster analytics and great writing, that's the other Kevin Butler. So I work on the spatial statistics team, and I came to Esri just five years ago from academia. Yeah, I also have an academic background and joined Esri about the same time, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, five years ago now. Yeah. So uh, this, this deck has a lot of details in it, and it has a lot of resources. If you want to copy this very first URL here, um, that's, that's, that URL is the slides that we're looking at right now. So. Um, you can get from that, you can just follow along if you want. Um, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to be in the business of furiously trying to write down URLs. Um, and then also the second URL here is the, uh, this is the, the slides themselves, it's got the PDF, and then there's a number of examples we're gonna walk through, and those examples are all gonna be at that location. Um, I think maybe one of them we haven't gotten up there yet, but I'll, I'll get that yeah. up uh, later today. Uh, and then I mentioned that there's a resources section. Depending on how much time we have, we can, eat, you know, if we have more time, I can go through that a little bit more. But really, the idea here is that this is a starting point for those of you who are new to SciPy or, or you're trying to expand what you already know of SciPy. So that resources section is pretty comprehensive. I'm not going to sit there and read every resource to you, but uh, the idea being that you could go back to that afterward and kind of see see what are some logical next next steps for you. Okay, so first, uh, Kevin's gonna give us a little bit of background on, on scientific computing. Well, scientific computing is just that. It's kind of this new world of e-science where we're taking this familiar process of doing science and applying technology to it uh, to all of the various stages. So it's the application of any computational method, really, to all of the processes of scientific investigation. And that means data acquisition um, <clears throat> or data gathering. It is also the idea of data management, analysis, visualization, and finally sharing of that data. And through the Python APIs, through SciPy, through the ArcGIS platform as a whole, we provide support in some format um, for all of these different phases of the process of, of scientific computing. Yeah, and another kind of background piece to this is this idea of extending ArcGIS, right? ArcGIS is the system of record. It lets you combine data from a number of different environments. You know, GIS in general is a very integrative uh, computing environment. Uh, but, you know, we already support that, you know, over a thousand geoprocessing tools. And we continue to add to that set of tools, but we typically don't ever remove a tool, right? Your tools don't break, they continue to work over time. One of the trade-offs is that we can't do everything, right? There's just too many different things. So by having this kind of extension model where you can now take advantage of external things, it kind of frees you up from having to always be waiting on us to implement some specific feature in a specific GP tool. Uh, and it's kind of a nice, it's a, it's a nice complement to that, uh, those GP tools coming in. Okay, so first, you know, we're really talking about Python today. Why, you know, what, what's the deal with Python? Well, first of all, um, it's, really, it's really blown up as a language, right? Um, you know, maybe 15 years ago, if 10 years ago, if you were, um, well, 15 years ago, if you're going, you're an undergrad, you probably were learning something like Pascal, um, you know, there's, maybe C++, C, um, and then probably about 10 years ago, you probably would have been learning Java. Um, and it's hard, right? If you, if you ever took, if you've taken an introductory computer science class without any programming experience, you know, someone puts up some code that says like, you know, static void main, and then like some things you don't know about, and then you see like the word print somewhere like in the middle, right? And then all the other, you know, all the other things in there have like semantic meaning and you don't know what they are. It's really confusing. And your, your professor's like, well, just ignore all that. And we'll get to that later, right? And they don't actually even get to that in the first computer science class because it takes more knowledge to understand what all that means. Well, so, you know, Python's really kind of 
come around in part because of that, because it, it's very accessible. It's still, you know, it's still programming, it's still hard, it's not like it just makes it trivial, but it, it, it eliminates enough of those kinds of things that someone can get into it much more simply than it has been possible in the past. Now, there have been specialized languages designed for teaching, things like, like Logo and, and other languages that um, often are graphical based, and those are, I would say, even simpler, but the trade-off is that they have pretty bounded problems they can solve. Python's actually a real programming language. It gets used in a lot of contexts for many different things. And, and partly because of that, it's gotten a very large set of, ex, of packages that have been built on top of it. Um, there's, when I wrote the slide, 56,000 on Py, Pi, there's probably more now. Um, it's got a broad user base. And you know, one thing that's great about it, coming from the spatial context, is that it's this glue language that can be used to bind together many different environments. And those environments don't necessarily have to be Python-based, right? So there's a lot of things in the Python ecosystem that are really just thin wrappers around some functionality that exists in, say, a C library or a C++ library. And that really gives you a lot of power at your fingertips because you can now interface with something that otherwise you might have to learn you know, that specific implementation in C++ or something, and it would be you know, a lot of work to integrate that into your workflow. And the last thing is that it's open source. Uh, it has a liberal license. You can pretty much do what you want with it. Um, and it's run by a community uh, organization. So um, it's nice because you can pretty much use it in any context, and it's, it's, it's probably going to fall within the terms of the licensing. So th we're going to talk a little bit py about Python here. Um, there's some resources at the end of the talk to give you an introduction if you've never seen Python code at all, but uh, you're, feel free to, to walk away right now if uh, seeing actual Python code is scary to you. Um, all right, so uh, Python and ArcGIS, what, what, how do we interact with it today, right? So there's a few different ways. Um, you know, the main way that you know, many folks do it is through ArcPy, right? They, um, they're trying to automate some process, they're trying to do some analysis, and they don't necessarily want to, you know, learn Arc objects, so they use ArcPy to do the actual analysis steps. And we've really, you know, built up this incrementally over many years, so it does a lot of different things, right? We have an interactive window for evaluating Python in the application, we have things like Python add-ins, so you can make extensions to the UI using Python, Python toolboxes, so you can create tools and uh, script tools and collections of script tools as toolboxes. Uh, and then also a lot of the product groups within Esri have specialized extensions that are parts of ArcPy, right? So working with map documents or geostatistics, you can do all that from within ArcPy as well. And if you saw the plenary or you know, you've been going to other talks, you probably have heard about the ArcGIS API for Python. It's also a new entry point into Python for ArcGIS, right? Currently, it's focused on, on more on services model, but it also can interact with, with some of the stuff we're going to talk today about, this, the SciPy stuff. So you know, what, what, what kind of things do we have? Well, if you're using Pro, uh, we're, on a, uh, we're on Python 3.5. Um, in, in ArcMap, you're on Python 2.7. There are some differences between Pro and ArcMap, or sorry, between Pro and, and, yeah, between Pro and ArcMap. We try to minimize them as much as possible. Um, there are a few areas where the actual context has changed. And what I mean by that is at the top level of ArcMap, you have a map document. At the top level of Pro, you have a project file, right? So we can't just like make that not exist as a difference. Um, but, but as much as possible, we've kept the APIs exactly the same. You can take some code, it should work in both places. There are some differences with Python 2 and 3, but they're relatively minor. Um, I think, you know, it's, people talk about it sometimes, but we basically write all of our code as both being Python 2 and Python 3 compatible, and it's a little bit of work to learn in, in the beginning, but it's really not that hard once you've, you've done a little, uh, little bit of poking around at it. We also continue to add new modules. So the good thing about adding modules is that when we put a module into the base system, you know it's going to be there. You can rely on it into the future, right? So you don't have to worry about getting, if you're, if you're making some code that you need to share with someone else or you want it to continue to go forward in time, you know that if it's in the base environment, you're going to get that going on in the future, right? So we're not gonna break backward compatibility of the scripts you write. So we've been adding lots of things, things like there's a NetCDF library, libraries for interacting with Excel, writing PDFs, PIP, all kinds of things we continue to add new packages to that base environment. That's on top of the sci-fi stuff we'll talk about in a minute. 
We also have uh, Python raster functions. Um, so those let you do things like actually on the fly while you're trying to visualize a certain area, you can do a kernel density or some kind of like neighborhood based analysis to generate the new output values you're looking at in the map. And that can be used in both the server context and in desktop. It's pretty good if you, need, if you needed to do like some real time NDVI calculation on some data, you could just use one of these function chains to compute it in real time just on the view window, right? Because if you had like a, a global data set for something, you know, it's not exactly trivial to compute that whole thing at once, right? So this lets you step away from that. So we're really here talking about the SciPy stack, right? Which is this specific piece of that story. Um, and a little bit more generally, like about moving towards maintainable, reusable code and kind of stepping away where we can from like writing one-off scripts that don't have use uh, reuse. Um, and one thing that you'll kind of see throughout the different packages we talk about is that multi-dimensional data structures are really great. Um, they're, they're really useful for a lot of problems, even if you don't think you have a multi-dimensional data uh, problem. Um, and also, uh, later tomorrow, um, Brendan Collins, who's uh, here from our, our technology partner, Continuum Analytics, is going to be presenting on some of the work that Continuum Analytics is doing, which includes this package called Dask, which um, does a really a lot of cool stuff, again, with multidimensional data, but in the context of um, scaling that across many different instances of, of machines to, to do some analysis. So worth checking out if you have a problem that might fit into that space. Okay, so, what, okay, I've mentioned SciPy a lot without de describing what it is. Let's do that. So, you know, what, why, why do we want something like SciPy? Well, if you just have a generic programming language, it's often missing a lot of the core language features that you want to do scientific analysis, right? So if you just have strings, that only gets you so far. Um, and, and Python's also that way, just out of the box, right? It doesn't have complex number support. It, it, has, it, has, it actually does have some very limited statistics now for like basic summary statistics, but you couldn't do you know, an ANOVA with it. You couldn't do anything more complicated, and it doesn't have vector primitives. Um, and you also have the, the issue that a lot of scientific code is often really, o it's really old. It might rely on, on Fortran models, on things that have been around for 50 years, and those things are often very procedural, right? They're not written in some, you know, new fancy object-oriented or functional model. They're, they're written in some older approach, but often those things work well, right? They don't, that code has not been replaced because it's still working good code. And um, yeah, so kind of SciPy is about bridging that gap. How do we bring together these pieces that we need for doing scientific computation into Python? And uh, they, they, really, they really brought that story together. So Python's kind of at the core here. And we're going to talk about these other pieces. These are all parts of the SciPy stack. These are all, all the packages on the slide are things we'll talk about today and things that are included with ArcGIS um, you know, from, I think, 10.4 onward. OK, so you know, there's, there's packages that make up this environment. And I just wanted to give you a sense of their names, but also really about something else about them, which is that, first of all, there are a lot of, they, they represent a lot of code, right? Um, and this is Python code, so Python code tends to be pretty condensed for, for doing you know, something that in another language might take up much more space. Uh, but you know, I think, I think that's even more important here is if you look at the, the last two columns, contributors and stars. So stars are on GitHub, you can mark a project being of interest to you. Um, but even more important than that, these contributors are unique contributors. Um, so I've, I've you know, made it so that it, it only will count someone once. So they contributed to all six of these projects. They only get counted once. But there's almost 2,000 people who have written some part of one of these packages, right? It's a really big base of users. And a lot of these people who are writing these packages aren't just like, you know, someone writing a blogging engine or something. A lot of them are actual like academics who are working in particle physics or doing something where they, they need to take advantage of Python for doing their analysis, and they extend one of these packages to help them solve their specific problem. So it's pretty cool. There's a pretty cool community around this that's, uh, that's great. If you, uh, if, you have, if you get interested, you can definitely get involved. There's lots of opportunities there. So we're kind of going to go through this list of packages a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start with the simplest one, which is Nose. You can see that it's only 7,000 lines of code. You know, you could probably read that before the end of the talk? Well, no, not really. But um, so it's, it's uh, what is it? It's just a testing framework. Um, so one of the ideas here is that if you can, you know, you want to test your code, right? 
testing gives you this productivity boost over time because you can make some code, validate that it works by writing a test, and then later when you change your code, you don't have to remember exactly what you were doing in every detail, which is very difficult to do. You can instead let, run your tests again and make sure that you haven't introduced any regressions, and when you do hit issues, you can add tests to say that you've, you've, you've verified that you've solved them. Um, so it's kind of a base thing that all of these packages use. There's some other newer testing frameworks in Python as well, but um, if you haven't looked at testing, I, I definitely recommend it, um, and those is a decent place to start. Really, the heart of the SciPy stack is num NumPy. So I mentioned that you know typically programming languages lack some of these fundamental features we need for working with scientific data. NumPy is really the, the starting point for solving that. And it, it, it does support random number generation number three on that list, but really the important parts are the first two. It has this idea of a multidimensional array structure that can be of homogeneous types, and it can do very quickly mathematical operations on those multidimensional arrays. And that uh, is very powerful for solving many different kinds of problems. And we'll get, we'll get into it a little bit more. I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna talk about it in, in great depth, but you can imagine that you, maybe you have something where you have you know, some raster data. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty easy, you know, that's just a two-dimensional array. Um, but you might have raster data over time, so you can imagine be storing that as kind of this cube structure. Um, but there's lots of things, even with just tabular data, where having it in this format can be really advantageous for you. And it also means that um, the memory footprint of the representation of this data is very concise. You can actually type each of these arrays and say, well, this array is gonna be of you know, 64-bit float values, and this array is gonna be of strings, and NumPy's very smart about making that take up the least resources it needs to to do what you need to do. So typically in a dynamic language like Python where you get lots of things managed for you, it's expensive when you ask for a new object, right? You might say, I just want a new dictionary, and like you add one element to it, and there goes like two kilobytes of RAM. Now it doesn't sound like much, but if you're doing things with lots of elements, you know, that overhead cost can really eat into your ability to do your analysis. So NumPy is really nice because it's, it's been thought out to, to, to minimize the amount of memory overhead of the objects it creates. So how do you use it in, in relation to ArcGIS? So as Sean indicated, Num, NumPy is the foundation of SciPy. Most of the SciPy routines understand NumPy arrays directly. They output NumPy arrays. So it's important to be able to get our data from the ArcGIS platform into those NumPy arrays quite easily. Um, it is an in-memory data model, but it's a pretty efficient data model. So I've gotten up to, I ran an analysis yesterday with a little over 52 million points um, and didn't have any problems in the ArcGIS Pro environment. So we've provided some convenience functions to help you get data that's in traditional GIS formats directly into NumPy arrays. So we have a feature class to NumPy array. You've got a series of points in ArcMap. You want to get those into a NumPy array with their attribute values. You don't want to go out and get a GDAL library to know how to read different feature data sets. You just want to bring those directly in. You can just pass that feature class, that ArcGIS feature class, into feature class to NumPy array. Same thing for tables, quite easy. And what's quite helpful is raster to NumPy array. So it'll take your raster on disk or in memory, it'll convert that directly to a NumPy array. If it's a multi-dimensional raster, uh, it'll create um, a 3D NumPy array for it. And those can get passed into one of many, many functions that exist within SciPy. So these convenience functions allow you to read GIS formats directly into NumPy arrays, then you have the full power of the SciPy stack at that point, you do your analyses, and often you wanna take the results of that analysis back into ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro. In order to get it back out of NumPy arrays into things that we know how to map, we have NumPy array to feature class, NumPy array to table, and NumPy array to raster. So just really one line of code will get you from a known GIS format into something that SciPy can understand, one line of code to get it back into a format that we can map and, and continue with the analysis.
Okay, so yeah, and I think Kevin might have mentioned this, but one thing that's great about these utilities too is that you can um, you can say like if you had a really big raster, you can actually tell it will only give me this piece of it right now, right? So even if you were in a situation where you couldn't all fit in memory in NumPy, you can kind of do some partitioning on that data and work through blocks of the data. So another piece of this stack is is plotting, right? So um, the, some folks who are in the Python world were coming from from MATLAB, and they said, "Well, I want to make plots like I have in MATLAB." Um, so they kind of created a library that that emulates um, the same interface as what MATLAB has. It can make all kinds of crazy plots, right? They're primarily scientifically oriented, um, but it can do um, some pretty interesting things. They can be embedded in a bunch of different environments and really kind of focused on like publication quality, you know, figure one style plots for, for academic papers. So the SciPy package itself, we have this name SciPy stack. There's a package also called SciPy. And it's really, so we got NumPy, we got this core data model. We now have, you know, matplotlib for plotting out the results of the things we're doing. But that doesn't really get us very far in actually doing scientific analysis. So all the, ex all the stuff you actually want to do on the analysis front exists in the SciPy module. So it's really, and you know, again, this is, this is being worked on by people from many, many different scientific disciplines. So you know, these are pretty broad areas, right? They're not like ecology. They're like you know, yeah, integration optimization problems, Fourier transforms, you know, signal processing. They're very, they're very much the high level kind of fundamental building blocks of doing analysis. Um, two that we're going to get into a little bit more, well, three I guess we can talk about to some extent, is the spatial module, um, the statistic. I'm going to show you two examples, one from the statistics module and one using the multidimensional image processing module, uh, ND image. So, uh, Actually, yeah, before I go on, I should mention that this, there is this uh, spatial, um, there's this spatial module here, and that includes a lot of really cool stuff. If you had something where you actually needed to implement, like, say, like a KD tree on data that you had, you wanted to work directly, so a KD tree is a, a way of spatially indexing data. If you wanted to work on that directly because you had some specific needs, you can do that using SciPy. So it's, they're often like lower level things or things that we have tools for working with, but there are certain cases where you actually need to get into the actual data structures, and, and SciPy would provide that even in the spatial context. So here's an example of using one of these modules. In this case, I'm using the stat submodule. So a lot of these, uh, how these packages are organized is you have the top level SciPy. So you say import SciPy and then you import whatever submodule you're going to be using. In this case, I'm using the stats module. And the idea here is I want to calculate this, this thing called a geometric mean. And I want to do that in one shot across the entire raster, right? So I don't want to be doing something where I like look at the value one cell and then you know add that to some kind of counter and then look at the value for the next cell and keep incrementing my counter. Uh, we want to just get back the value, right? So it's really easy to do these kinds of things in SciPy. So I, all I need to do is I pull in the module, I pull in, so I take in my input raster, in this case a geotiff, and then I use that conversion function that Kevin was talking about here, raster to numpy array, to take that input geotiff and generate a numpy array that I can work with now in Python. So at this point here, we have an, a numpy array, one of these data structures that everything in the SciPy stack knows how to plug into. And now finally, to calculate this overall raster geometric mean, I ask the stats module for this gmean call, and then I pass it my numpy array, and the second parameter here, you see this thing called axis none. Well, one of the things, if you, if you think about it, you have this kind of cube of data or even a multidimensional data structure, one of the things you have to tell it is how are we looking at that? Are we, are we going across one dimension? Are we going, you know, are we going across the x dimension, the y dimension, z, or, or other dimensions of the data? Axis none says just flatten out the whole thing. I, I might have some kind of complicated structure. I want the, I want the, I want the mean over that entire data structure. Another example I just want to give you is uh, Benthic Train Modeler. So Benthic Train Modeler is a it's a open source extension for ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro that does uh, geomorphology operations. And just wanted to show you an example of using it to do a geomorphology operation using SciPy. So um, it's both an add-in and a Python toolbox. It's if you if you're writing either of those kinds of things, you can definitely take a look at the GitHub site for it. Um, it's implemented in a pretty nice way. 
And it has a pretty active community of users, you know, primarily marine scientists, but many, many people in other domains as well. It's not really, it, it started as a benthic terrain package and really looking at just a benthic terrain, but it can be used for any terrestrial data as well. The algorithms that it implements are, are useful in both contexts. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna kind of we're gonna do two, two things. We we looked at scipy.stats for uh, sorry, we, we looked at scipy stats already. We're gonna look at another example using scipy stats. And then I'm gonna show you using for for this geomorphology operation, I want to use this ND image, uh, ND image sub sub module for multi-scale analysis. So what does that look like? Okay. So I'm gonna import the ND image module again. I'm importing matplotlib to generate an output plot. Do the same thing we did before. In this case, you can see here, I'm just pulling out the first 200 by 200 window of the raster. So I'm taking this input raster. I'm only gonna clip out a little piece of it. I just want this little, the top corner of my raster, not the whole thing, right? Because this thing might be giant. Some of these files can be terabytes in size. So we just wanna clip out the first little corner. And then we're going to start a plot. We're going to use matplotlib here to say, I'm going to make a figure. And this figure is going to have, it's going to have 10 by, it's going to be a 10 by 10 grid of, oh no, sorry, this is, this is a size in inches. But we're going to add, we're going to actually add some subplots to it. So we'll get there in a second. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to iterate, we're going to iterate uh, over the range of 1 to 25, or sorry, 0 to 20, 25 four and then we'll add to it afterward. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna be doing a median filter on that data. So you can imagine we've got the certain neighborhood that we're looking at and we're gonna be doing a median operation on that neighborhood. And then we'll, then we'll go through and we'll add each of those median filtered NumPy arrays back to the plot that we're making and then generate a plot that kind of summarizes that. So this is what that looks like. You can see starting here, and you can't quite see the very top numbers, but that's three by three in, in the upper left-hand corner, and then all the way down to 75 by 75. So this is just a smoothing filter, but you can really see at, at some scales, you can notice different phenomena dropping out, right? And so for the purposes of the geomorphology applications, this is useful because you might be interested in, in like say, uh, fish habitat, and you know that certain features are, are important for your predictive model. Like you can't go out and sample all the ocean floor, so you sample very limited locations. And then you try to build up some, like say an ANOVA model where you, you figure out the, the covariates which make predictions about your, the habitat. So you could use something like this to start help teasing that apart. And it's pretty quick, uh, pretty quick to, to run this. Another thing that you sometimes have to do is things like circular statistics, right? You might have variables like time, um, or aspect where the if you just do normal math with it, right? If you had if you had two values for aspect and you had one that was one and one that was three hundred and fifty nine, then the average of that is going to point due south, right? So it's going to be exactly the opposite of the correct average. Um, so you want to avoid that. So in order to do that, there's a few ways. Um, one really simple way is just breaking down that circular variable into two variables, right? So we can just use some basic trigonometry and convert the, the value into its sine and cosine values. And we can, use, we can do that using SciPy. So this is all that it takes. We can just, we can pass it in something. Uh, well, so actually, I'm oh, sorry. So I, you could do it just using sine and cosine without any other work. But in this case, SciPy actually even supports circular statistics directly. So again, same idea. We just take our input raster, we convert it into a NumPy array, and then it has and the unfortunately names scipy.stats.morestats, uh, not the best namespace, but inside of there, there are these circular mean uh, statistics we can get back, right? So we can get back circular mean, circular standard deviation, and variance. So we can do that without even having to do any more complicated math. Okay, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin to do our next demo. Three. Okay. Great. So I had lots of choices within the SciPy stack to demo, uh, so I picked something that um, is kind of obscure, uh, but a lot of, a lot of applications for it. This is called Procrustes analysis. Um, it's used in the business world a lot. It got its name from Greek mythology. Procrustes is the son of Poseidon and was very hospitable. He set up a bed on the side of the road and wanted to comfort travelers. 
Um, his bed was made of iron, but he had a little bit of OCD, and he wanted everybody to fit the bed exactly. So he would either stretch the people until they were six feet tall. If they were taller than that, he would cut things off until they fit on the bed. Um, this method is hopefully not that violent, but what it is is it's a form of shape analysis, sometimes referred to as morphometrics. And what it does is that it basically looks at two-point patterns. Um, we'll use that example, two-point patterns, and says, in the presence of scaling or dilation, of rotation, um, change in origin, or reflection, are these two shapes the, th the same? So you're really only concerned about the, the shape, not necessarily where it is in space or if the shape is larger or smaller. Okay? So lots of applications for this. So it does scalings, rotations, and reflections between two matrices that you've stored in SciPy. So let's just look at a couple examples to see what that would look like. Very simple examples here. These are the blue dots and the red dots to my eyes are exactly the same. So I would expect there to be no disparity between these two point patterns. Let's see if we actually get that result. And we do. The Procrustes analysis is saying there's no difference between those, exactly what I would expect. What happens if I would go ahead and just scale those? Okay. Still a nice triangle, except triangle B just happens to be much larger. Um, still under Procrustes analysis, I would expect no difference between them. What if they have a different origin altogether? Again, A and B look like the same shape. One is just displaced. And again, Procrustes will say no difference. What happens if I actually have a different shape here B is certainly different from A, but these two points, you might be able to morph those two points. So I would expect some difference between these now. And indeed I do. I get a disparity measure of 0.25. And what if I have even a bigger difference in the shape? It would be very difficult to morph that in any way to look like this nice neat triangle. So I think I should get a higher disparity measure uh, when I'm looking at this one. In 0.375, we're actually getting that. Well, how can we apply this to a real world problem? Um, I've actually seen Procrustes analysis used in the analysis of elephant footprints. Um, it's used in medical imagery a lot. Anything that you can establish a series of landmark points on, you should be able to compare um, you know, those things with morphometric analysis. So I thought we'd pick a fun example, which I've not shared with my co-presenter. Um, but here we have the various stages of, of Sean. And uh, I, for convenience, I've named these on your far left. This is soap opera star Sean. <laughs> Uh, the middle one is GQ Sean, and the right is geographer Sean. Okay? So it kind of looks like the same person, but what if I wanted to quantify that in some way? What I could actually do is just put some control points. Can you see those in the back? Um, I very crudely just picked four control points on Sean's face. You can see that these images are at different scales. Okay? So, um, and you can see they're at different rotations. In this far right one, Sean's head is tilted a little bit. Um, here we're looking at a very different view in the left one. So I want to know if these are actually the same person. Okay? So what I'm going to do, I've actually just digitized those points and put them into simple NumPy arrays. And do I get results? So actually, I'm getting pretty similar results between soap opera star Sean and GQ Sean. Same thing between soap opera star Sean and geographer. And a little bit of difference, a little, uh, actually less of a difference between GQ and geographer. Uh, one of the reasons that there might be a difference in the disparity measures, Sean's smiling a little more here. He's outside. I think this is Santa Barbara someplace. Maybe? Hawaii, yeah. Oh, Hawaii, nice. <laughs> 
and uh, his chin's a little farther down. So you might want to choose better control points. Um, but you know, a poor programmer's method of facial recognition, um, if you had, say, two burn patterns um, or two wildlife home range polygons, um, then you could just simply set landmarks on those things and compare any two, any two patterns. Um, and it scales quite nicely. I've also seen it applied in non-spatial contexts because it's what SciPy is doing at this point is simply comparing two matrices. Um, so I've seen this used in business contexts where you're looking at sales in January and sales in May, and you might have product categories as rows in your matrix, and you've got various stores as columns. And of course, sales might be much stronger in May than they are in January, but your question is, is relatively, is the, the product mix the same between those two months? Well, because May sales are so much higher, it might be difficult to compare those. You just drop these two matrices into uh, the Procrustis analysis, and it will give you a disparity measure um, that has taken into account scaling. Okay. The question is, for me, was are these st statistically significant? SciPy doesn't have an ability to do that, but um, I've written some quick code. I didn't include it in the notebook to actually permute these and actually get a p-value so that you can know whether or not two images are significantly different from each other. Okay. Very cool. Okay, awesome. So just a quick interlude. You know, I mentioned a multidimensional data. What is multidimensional data? Well, one of the things is how do you store it on disk, right? You can, once you get things in these NumPy arrays, you can do all kinds of things, but typically you don't want to store raw NumPy arrays. You want it stored in some format that can deal with the hierarchical na na nature of the data structure, deal with having multiple variables in there. And there's a few, you know, cool formats now for doing that. Uh, so NetCDF, uh, NetCDF's been around for a while. NetCDF 4 actually has HDF 5 as its backing store. And uh, it has some really cool stuff in it. So we have a package called NetCDF4 in the Python distribution that comes with ArcGIS. It lets you interact with these directly from, from Python. You can also use it to get things out of remote. Oh, you can't see what I'm. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. OK, well, just, uh, just read really fast. Um, OK, so, so, but the basic idea is there's this package called NetCDF. Um, you can use it for interesting things. It supports OpenDAP, so that's this idea that people are you know, hosting these multidimensional data sets on the internet, uh, OpenDAP, and there's also things, things called thread servers, so you can directly access those using this NetCDF module in Python. This is in addition to the, the large set of tools that we have in ArcJS, so we have a multidimensional toolbox, but there still are some contexts where you just need to get down into the data, and you might be in some workflow where you're, you're writing out specific values. You can kind of manipulate into the details of this, again, because we have, that, we have NumPy as that inner, interoperability layer, right? So once we're at this level and we've got back one of these NetCDF files or HDF5 files, we can now do some analysis and then stick it back into another NetCDF object at the end of that process. So this is just a quick example of, of just opening a NetCDF file in Python. So we have a, a NetCDF file called test.nc. We tell it the format of the data, and then we can get back a bunch of details. We could then pull out the NumPy array structures of certain variables in that. We could do all kinds of cool stuff um, with, with that data in Python. We also are continuing to work on improvements for multidimensional data. So We've been adding new formats, things like GRIB, HDF, uh, I mentioned HDF already. Um, we keep looking at what's happening in that space and how we make it easy for you to interact with remote services. So that's things like I mentioned OpenDAP. Um, we added a vector renderer, so if you had a, a, one of these data sets, you could actually render it, render it over time. Um, and it, just fitting it in with the rest of the platform story, right? That takes time to build up, but we do continue to work on that. And even though you may not have heard about NetCDF before, it's not, it's not an obscure data source. Um, it's estimated, NOAA has told us that about 80% of their data is actually delivered in NetCDF format. So if you're an app developer and you want to include you know, near real-time weather forecasts or weather data into your apps, 
you simply, with this NetCDF4 library, point off to one of NOAA's or NASA's um, OpenDAP data servers, and then you can pull that data directly into a NumPy array and include it in your app. Yeah. All right, so, and yeah, next we're gonna talk about Pandas. Uh, Pandas is really cool. If, if back at that chart I showed you with all the different packages and the number of stars, Pandas actually winning that, uh, that popularity contest. And why is that? Well, uh, so the idea is it's panel data, that's where the, the name comes from. And these are, if you've used R before, these are what are called data frames. Um, and you know, it's, it's really about trying to bring this robust data analysis workflow into Python. So you might have something relatively simple like tabular data, you might have time series data, and it knows how to deal with that. It actually came out of, um, originally actually out of a hedge fund, um, AQR, and uh, you know they deal with a lot of time series data in the financial world. And so they kind of wanted this model where they could interact with the time series data, do aggregations on it, do kinds of changes to it quickly and simply. And uh, that's, that's really what data frames are about. They let you treat tabular data and multidimensional data in a way that really facilitates analysis. So if you just had an Excel spreadsheet, right, you have a two-dimensional, you know, you have this two-dimensional set of data, but if you've actually tried to do real analysis with, with that, you know how much work it is to, to munge one of those data files into something you can actually do analysis with, right? Because people aren't consistent in how they enter in the columns and they add notes in the middle of things and it's just, it takes a lot of work to break that down. So data frames kind of, they, you, you pay a little bit of price up front, you're a little bit strict about how you let the data come in, but then you have actually like typed information in there. So you can, you can actually, you, you treat your data as this labeled index series of observations and you can do really interesting things once you've made that choice. So I'm only gonna show you the most simple possible example here uh, and Kevin will show you a little bit better example but I really recommend if you have to deal with data that you're you maybe used to iterating over or having to work with in some, you know, how would we do this without using pandas? Well, it might be something like we open up a cursor and then we like fix all the columns when we read the one column and we try to get our parser to do the right thing and split the things right. So pandas deals with a lot of that for us out of the, out of the box. And it also is pretty good at integrating with um, external packages that are in your Python in install. So for example, if you have Excel files, it knows how to use the right library to read the Excel files. But here I'm just gonna use a simple CSV file. All this stuff is up on, on the GitHub repository if you wanna check it out later. Uh, one of my favorite TV shows is The Simpsons. And I wanted, to, I wanted to explore the question of when did The Simpsons get bad, right? There's this idea of television shows jumping the shark. It's important to me to try to identify that, right? I have my own intuition about when it got bad, but everyone seems to have a different idea. So I wanted to start using pandas to look at that question. So I pulled together this basic data set that um, it, it includes some information about what season we're in, how many households watched it, and some other information about the, the percentage of prime time um, viewers that that represents. And this, so if we just ask the columns, we're getting back this index of columns, right? So already, you know, these things are pretty familiar to us. We see, okay, it's just a bunch of strings, but we could actually just ask pandas for one of those things. We also can do some interesting aggregation on that very simply. So I'm just gonna do one of these really simple aggregations here. Um, so I'm gonna ask it, uh, I'm gonna ask it about the data. We have the data that we're looking at, and I wanna know the places where the prime time percentage, the percentage of people watching The Simpsons at a time is greater than 50%. Right, so that's gonna give us back a new data frame. And in that new data frame, we, we so it, it's just another data frame, we can treat it, we can just keep iteratively operating on these things, but we have exactly the same construct, right? So we, this is pretty nice, because if you were to do this with looping, it would be complicated. And this is the most simple possible case, but it actually lets you do very other kinds of interesting aggregations on the data. Now, unfortunately for our analysis here, um, we're, we're hit by a very strong causation correlation problem. Uh, well, two problems. One is that Nielsen rating is, are, you know, very unreliable. And the other one is that the time frame this corresponds to is exactly the time frame of the collapse of primetime television, right? So this is when people started switching over to cable and now we have the multi-device problem. So it's very, it, 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 it made it many confounding factors in this. But it was really cool to see that at the beginning of the show, they had over, you know, 70% of the primetime market uh, cornered for, for, for their show in the, in the early 90s. Okay, and with that, I'll give it over to Kevin to give you a real pandas demo. Yeah.
Okay, I'm a, I'm a big fan of pandas. Um, I do you know, a lot of data analysis. About 50% of my time is often spent cleaning the data. Um, even though it comes from reliable sources, as Sean indicated, there's notes in the middle of it. It's not quite what you expected. It's always too much data. So I'm going to go ahead and import pandas here. Um, I'm using data from the U.S. Department of Transportation, their air carrier statistics. Um, they report a sample from every airport in the United States for every month, the number of passengers. So from Palm Springs, when you fly from Palm Springs back to Buffalo, that gets recorded. Those get summed up and the Department of Transportation releases that, that data. So I'm going to do a, some quick analyses on that. You can see that this data comes in CSV format, but it's zipped. But with Pandas, I don't need to worry about that. It understands how to read zipped files. I don't need to spend the time doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and read that and get a count. Um, I just read about 100, 168,000 records right there. Okay. You can see that I've got lots of columns here. This is indeed a data frame, much easier for me to work with in this format. But you can see there's lots of columns that I'm not interested in. I just want to aggregate this data all together. I don't need to retain the year or the month or the unique carrier ID. So what I'm going to do is read the data back in at this point and only use the columns for passenger or origin and destination. I don't need to go to my CSV files and delete all of those things out. My original data are still there. Let's look at that data again. Ah, much better. I now have a data frame that I can actually work with. I'm going to do some quick statistics on that just to see what I have. Ooh, and I've got a minimum of zero. Well, I'm not concerned about those airports. I'm not going to include those in my analyses. So I can run a query against my data frame and only get those records where passengers are greater than 10,000. Let's see what that looks like. That's good. My minimum now is about 10,004. So I've got fairly clean data at this point. Uh, what I want to do is be able to compress that down. I want to get a summary for each of the origin destination combinations, any unique combination of origin destination. So I can simply ask pandas to group by the origin and destination, and as it's doing that grouping, I want to aggregate the number of passengers by summing them together. Did that. So it looks like there's about, between Albuquerque and Atlanta, about 62,000 passengers. Okay. Now several of the SciPy routines actually take matrices. If I wanted to analyze this in kind of an origin destination matrix, right now they're in row order. I want to actually transpose those so that I get an origin destination matrix. I've done that. I have origin and destination, but I've got a lot of NANDs. And I don't want to process those in my analysis, so I'm going to fill those NANDs actually with zero at this point. And with very few lines of code, I've gotten a fairly large data set cleaned and in a format that I can now analyze it. Great. All right, and the last uh, major package that I want to introduce to you after switching my projector is SymPy. So what does SymPy do? SymPy is a computer algebra system, and it knows how to solve math equations, right? One of the typical problems you have to deal with is that computers deal only with finite, discrete things, and they can't do things like integration. Well, there's a few of these, these CAS systems, and SymPy is one, and it's included in ArcPy. Um, it's, sorry, it's included in ArcMap and in ArcGIS Pro. So you can, uh, here again, I'm just doing a very simple thing. I'm uh, taking you back to like algebra sometime in your, in your past, and I'm just setting up a, a simple uh, equation, right? I've got, I'm, I'm defining a symbol here. So I'm, from, I'm importing all of SymPy by saying from SymPy import star. I'm defining that we have this character here that we're going to use as, a, as representing a symbol, right? So we're gonna create a new equation 
and we're going to have a, a cube parameter and then two times the x parameter, so on. And so we've, we've set up a very basic equation, right? It's not, not a system equation, but we just want to find out the value of x, right? Had to do that a lot if, uh, in algebra class. So um, we, can, we can use SymPy to solve that very simply. We just ask it, we've got this equation, we want to solve for the value of x. And it gives us three possible solutions, one in the real domain and two in the imaginary domain, right? So we got that very simply, um, and this scales to very complicated problems too, right? I'm showing you the most basic one here, but you can use it for very complicated problems as well. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Kevin to show you a more complicated SymPy yeah. demo. So this is where the scary math comes in, but I also show you a way to completely avoid the scary math. Um, I taught for a number of years, and um, on days where I wasn't quite feeling kind towards my students, um, I would accuse them of being unapologetically enumerate. Um, but with SIMPI, you don't need to be a math major in order to leverage the power, uh, the computational power of SIMPI. SIMPI, so for a real world example, suppose I have two measurements, and both of those measurements have some kind of uncertainty associated with them. I want to be able to combine them into a better measurement. Okay? Normally, what would we do? Two measurements, you'd probably typically take the average of those two. But averaging them doesn't take into account the fact that both of them have uncertainty. Maybe one of them has a lot of uncertainty. You wouldn't want to give that one equal weight in your calculation. Okay? So let's use a temperature example. So assume that we've got um, a model of temperature and this t um, climate model says that it's 30 degrees outside, but we know that there's plus or minus three degrees there. Okay? So think of a normal curve. I can simply model that by saying the temperature has a mean of 30, but it could be plus or minus three degrees. Okay? And I tested this right before. Didn't run that cell. I'm good. There we go. So let's say I want to find the probability that the temperature is actually greater than 33 degrees. Well, mathematically, this is how you would do it in order to produce a very accurate answer. I do not want to code that in Python. Okay? So I'm going to go out and I'm going to leverage the power of SymPy. SymPy, in order to evaluate that, that's the statement right there. What's the probability that the temperature is going to be greater than 33 degrees? Okay. This is what SIMPI is actually evaluating at this point. Again, I don't want to code that. I just want the answer. Okay. So the probability that it's going to be greater than 33 degrees, not great. There's not a lot of statistical evidence that says that, the, that it's going to be greater than 33 degrees. Okay. So let's say now I have a thermometer. I'm actually going to go outside and measure the temperature, but I know that my thermometer is not exactly accurate. The thermometer says it's 26 degrees outside, but it's plus or minus 1.5 degrees. So I've got two measurements, 30 degrees plus or minus on either side, 26 degrees plus or minus 1.5 degrees. How do I combine those two estimates, those two measurements together so that I can get a better estimate of the temperature? We're going to use a little bit of a Bayesian approach. We want to calculate a better estimate of the temperature. That's a posterior given our given observation of 26 degrees. Okay? That's, uh, we can think of that as a prior. This is the equation that it's going to do. Again, I don't want to code that in, in Python. Whoops, thank you. So I'm going to add that amount of noise to my measurement. It calculated it. Let me show you how it calculated combining those two estimates together. There we go. Ooh, I really don't want to code that in Python. What I really want is just the stinking combination of those two numbers. And indeed, if I combine my two estimates together, 
um, it's going to be about 26.8 degrees outside. So a lot of computational power underneath of the hood. Um, often you do not need to worry much about the mathematics. I trust me, people have tested these libraries quite well. Um, and very, very simple symbolic language here in order to leverage uh, a lot of symbolic statistics. Great. All right, so uh, just a couple more things here before we wrap up. So a question I always have is if someone shows me something, well, where do I get it and how fast is it, right? That's a good, good question to ask. Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of places you can get this now, right? Uh, from from 10.4 on, pretty much this whole stack is available in, in all of our products. Um, in Pro, it's been available for a while. We also, uh, we, I'll talk a little bit more about this performance aspect of it, but we, uh, we ship MKL-enabled versions of NumPy and SciPy. That's a, that's a package that Intel produces that really helps speed up a lot of these computational operations, right? A lot of these things rely on things like um, linear algebra at the bottom, so that really helps speed it up. There's also a lot of, a number of these pieces exist going way back, right? So for NumPy, it's been around since 9.2. Uh, Matplotlib came in a little later. SciPy and Pandas are the two most recent additions to that stack in the software. Um, we also have Conda now. So if you're in Pro or if you're on server, you can actually use Conda for installing additional packages and consuming all kinds of things, right? We're focusing here on the things that are included in the box. There's a lot of really cool stuff out there, including in the machine learning world, data science, all kinds of other things that are interesting that can be very easily installed that maybe in the past were very problematic to get into the same environment that you had ArcPy. And then last, we also now have the ArcGIS Python API, right? So again, that uses Conda. It can run anywhere Python runs, so you're not, you, don't, you don't have to be running that in the same context as, as your ArcMap instance. You could be doing that on another machine, on a Mac, or somewhere else. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about this already. There's this performance, um, and so this, this does some really cool stuff with that performance. You know, Intel can kind of, they can, they can cheat a little bit because they write the CPU. So by writing a compiler that directly conforms to the CPU, they can crank out some extra performance. And I'm going to show you a chart here. Uh, you need to take it with a very large grain of salt. It, I do not take this as gospel, but this is just one specific calculation, right? So if you can see the very small bars here at the bottom is this, this particular calculation without, num piece, without uh, MKL being available. And then um, MKL can uh, just work in a single core fashion. And then also, in this case, we have four cores available to us, so it can even parallelize that for us directly. So uh, this is just a, a, a particular operation multiplying two matrices where it provides a very significant speed up over what you get out of the box with, with NumPy. OK. And then, um, yeah, so what's, what's coming next? What's the future of this? Well, so I think, hopefully we showed you exactly what you get in the box. I think if you start learning this, if you start learning NumPy, you'll really find out that a lot of packages know how to integrate with it, and you can do some really cool stuff, right? We're not going to get to cover all that today, but there's really cool stuff going on in machine learning and deep learning, Bayesian modeling. There's also a lot, even with kind of backporting the frequentist world into Python as well, right? So stats models is a package that implements a lot of kind of the, the normal things that you would see if you were taking a stats class today. And then because we have Conda as the backing environment in Pro and Server, you can get really complicated things that aren't even based in the Python ecosystem, right? And you can start creating these tool chains that combine stuff from the Python world, things like TensorFlow, which is a machine learning environment that Google just put out, and even things from you know, Spark from, from, the, from other, other stacks, you can Im embed them all in one environment. And that's very powerful as a kind of a, a, glue, a glue framework. Okay, so the resources, I'm gonna fly through these because I wanna give at least a minute for questions. Um, there's a few other talks uh, that are happening. Uh, most of these, have or a couple of these have already happened. Um, tomorrow I mentioned this continuum analytics talk. Uh, just if you stay in this room and don't go anywhere, in a half hour we're gonna be talking about data science using R. Uh, and then there's a couple talks that have already happened, but I've linked to the videos from last year if you wanna go check those out. Um, again, this has a lot of resources here. I'm not going to, I'm just going to kind of fly through these, but there's some courses, there's books, there's GIS focused things, there's scientific computing with Python, there's uh, books on scientific computing with Python, um, some really great resources, some courses you can take, some specialty packages, there's some code that you might want to check out for do, doing some of these things, and there's specialized extensions just working with scientific problems in ArcGIS that are definitely worth checking out. There's some conferences too. If you want to get involved, a lot of these communities are very open, very inviting, and it's really great to get to talk to other people and find your peer group. All right, with that, I'm going to say thanks so much to my team, the geoprocessing team, and also thanks to all the people who made this software possible, right? There's a lot of people who made this code happen. 
And thanks to you for coming. And if you would like to rate the session, please feel free to do so. If you don't have a iOS phone or Android phone, then unfortunately you cannot leave feedback except with a cuneiform tablet, which I am happy to accept, though I do not know how to read Akkadian. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks.